Welcome to this webinar jointly organized by the AMFEF and the Banque de France. We would have liked to welcome you physically in the Banque de France, where I am this morning, but what a better way to demonstrate the digital transformation that holding an event in cyberspace. It has been common in recent years to hear about disruptive technologies, but over the past six months, information technology has instead been a crucial source of continuity between us in a highly disrupted world. Having said that, digitalization is one among many factors transforming central banking, and this will be my broader theme this morning. The ECB strategic review, rightly launched by Christine Lagarde, with an explicit list of challenges, is the opportunity to reflect on how the euro system should respond to them. However, let me briefly start with the short-term situation that we currently face. Uh, confronted with this unprecedented COVID crisis, we acted, we governing council, acted boldly and rapidly using all the tools at our disposal and even inventing new ones such as the PEP. By doing so, we successfully avoided both fragmentation and deflation. That said, inflation is not yet where we would like it to be, back towards 2% in the medium term. Have no doubt about our determination to act as much as needed and about our capacity to act. Again, this autumn, we are hearing the chatter about the ECB running out of ammunition. It proved completely wrong in March and it remains wrong today. If needed, the ECB has ample rule for manoeuvre. By the way, the yesterday's take up 174 billion euro of our TLTRO free confirms the attractiveness and the adequacy of this innovative tool. We decided to keep a steady hand in the last governing council due to the continuity of our economic forecast. But steady hands are not tight hands. We have free hands for the future. Let me now come to the core of my introduction this morning to the ECB's strategic review on which work has restarted after the peak of the COVID crisis. Our review is more extensive than the FOMC's as it will cover, among many things, structural changes such as climate change, financial stability, and yes, the effects of digitalization. The euro system will take its time, as the Fed did, to consider the different alternatives. What professional economists find theoretically appealing may not be either easily applicable or comprehensible to the general public. What financial markets expect in the short run is not always consistent with long-term economic objectives. But let me try today to share some preliminary thoughts on four key questions. First, is there such a difference between a dual mandate and the ECB's two-tiered mandate? Second, how could we clarify the inflation objective? Third, what about the second pillar of the ECB and is there a link with the so-called secondary objectives? And fourth, last but not least, how can we improve communication with the general public and economic actors? My aim obviously, is not to give today conclusive answers to these four questions, but to highlight some important elements of the debate. 
the Fed's conclusions are a significant part of it, but one shouldn't assume that the ECB will simply follow suit. Other contributions, such as the ECB license exercise, our academic roundtables, Sintra, which we will have in November, or the current review of Banque du Canada, are also important. And by the way, differences are not always were expected. So I start with my first question. Is there such a difference in mandates? For most observers, including European politicians, this is the most striking issue. The Fed has a dual mandate, including price stability and maximum employment, and the strategy review shifted its emphasis to the latter. The ECB, meanwhile, has a primary objective of price stability according to the treaties. Of course, it is our duty to stick to the treaties and our strategic review won't deviate a niche from them. However, let me only remind you that our legal mandate is not, as often mentioned and assumed, a purely single mandate. It is rather a two-tiered mandate that includes at least two other objectives without prejudice to price stability. And here I quote the treaties. First, to support the general economic policies in the Union, contributing, among other aims, to a social market economy aiming at full employment and social progress. All these words are in the treaties. Indeed. And second, and very important, the stability of the financial system. Furthermore, I would argue that there is in practice less of a difference between a dual mandate and flexible inflation targeting than people think. Noticeably, the measures we ECB have taken to offset the effects of negative shocks, such as the global financial crisis or this sanitary crisis, have a direct effect on growth and employment. And as far as demand shocks are concerned, the monetary policy prescriptions are the same. In principle, there are conflicts when there are supply shock. But inflation targeting central banks also tend not to react to temporary supply shocks, but respond only if there are signs of second round effects. I then come to my second question. How could we clarify the price stability objective? Indeed, the main substantive change by the FOMC is the introduction of an inflation makeup strategy. Rather than being solely forward looking, the FOMC will or could now correct for past inflation shortfalls. Let us here also discuss the areas of continuity. I used Jay Powell's own words in his speech of August 27th, and discuss also the possible differences. Continuity. The Fed confirmed our common strategy of inflation targeting. And it has kept 2% as its numerical goal. This conceptual convergence remains a cornerstone and a common cornerstone of modern central banking. It has perhaps not been enough stressed. Average inflation targeting is then a flexible tactic, possibly temporary, within a wider strategy of keeping inflation sustainably where expected. But still more importantly, in my view, the inflation target should be perceived as flexible, symmetric, and medium term. And allow me to be a bit more specific 
about these three key requirements. Flexible is the most obvious one. We cannot guarantee to achieve precisely our numerical objective either all the time or straight away. Symmetric means that our numerical objective is a target and not a ceiling. As a consequence, we might be ready to accept inflation higher than 2% for some time without mechanically triggering the tightening of our monetary stance. Commentators sometimes attribute a perceived asymmetry to our current definition of price stability below but close to 2%. The governing council frequently reaffirms its commitment to symmetry as it stands in our introductory statement since Mario Draghi. Nevertheless, we should examine whether the current formulation casts doubt on this. Medium term, it means that we should judge our inflation performance over a long enough period. We shouldn't forget what Jean-Claude Trichet often stressed as an optimal performance in the first years of the euro. And I quote him in Bavaria at the end of 2010. Interesting quotation, as you will see. Over these 12 years, the average annual inflation rate, I stress this wording, the average annual inflation rate, in the euro area has been 1.97%. We have achieved price stability in the euro area over, over what has already been quite a long horizon. I also stress this wording, and it's the end of the quotation. As I personally said in previous occasions, our medium-term target needs to be viewed in two ways. It has to be forward-looking to guide inflation expectations, but it cannot ignore the past either. All this is not explicit average inflation targeting ex ante, but it would achieve very similar outcomes ex post. We will have to discuss that. We will also have to discuss the precise formulation of our inflation objective in at least two respects. The below but close to, as already mentioned, and the measure of inflation we use. Continuity is a positive asset, but the inclusion of owner-occupied housing in the HICP is frequently, and somewhat rightly, suggested by the general public. And as you are aware, the preferred inflation measure of the Fed, the PCE index, includes these expenditures. Last but not least, our inflation objective, while clarified, should also be credible. I will come back to this with my fourth question about communication. Let me come to the third question about the second pillar of the ECB and its possible link with secondary objectives. For many, the history of the second pillar of monetary analysis of the ECB seems to be coming to an end. It was born as the first pillar in 1999 and coming at the time from the strict following of monetary aggregates by the Bundesbank and the Banque de France as well. It became the second pillar after 2003, passing behind the economic analysis of the inflation outlook. And due to the fact that it has progressively fallen into disuse, many suggest we should now call time on it during our strategic review. Is it that sure? Isn't there another alternative path more adequate than letting it disappear? There are three possible reasons for that. The second pillar allows a cross-check on the analysis of inflation. Second reason, we could possibly introduce a focus on nominal aggregates, whereas the first pillar focuses by its nature on prices and volumes. 
And finally, it could allow reference to some of the secondary objectives of the ECB, including financial stability. In our discussion to come, I believe we could study two types of aggregates. Financial aggregates from the perspective of financial stability and potentially looking more closely at the assets of financial institutions, including non-banks, such as a provision of credit in the broadest sense, rather than looking at the liabilities only, including money, as in the past. Financial aggregates and other economic aggregates, starting with nominal GDP, which has the virtue of combining real growth and prices, two variables that statisticians sometimes have difficulties separating in their measures. But also employment and income distribution, which respond to the demands of the treaties as well as to the expectations of the public. Allow me some short remarks on the substance of these secondary objectives, so-called secondary objectives. To achieve financial stability, we should go beyond the old debate between separation principle, separation between monetary policy and macroprudential policy, versus leaning against the wind. I advocate a median way, which we could call coordinated or integrated. Let me explain. We have now a range of unconventional monetary instruments, and our objective should be to pick within this toolbox the right combination that delivers the necessary accommodative monetary stance while minimizing adverse side effects on financial stability. On climate change, the emphasis put by Christine Lagarde herself is welcome and totally warranted in my view. The fight against global warming is already an imperative for us under our present price stability mandate. Not only will the effects of climate change have significant repercussions on future inflation and growth, but they are already having an impact now. And we could implement our climate decisions in no more than three to five years, which would make us pioneers among major central banks. My fourth and final remarks concern communication. Central banks have come a long way in being transparent about their decision and explaining their reasoning. However, our communication remains too often addressed to a narrow group of people. As we know, the media, the markets and economists. We need to do a better job of reaching the general public. And this means two changes of paradigm. It's not only a question of democratic accountability, however essential this remains, it is also key for our economic efficiency. And I will come back to it. Secondly, we should evolve from a narrow objective of transparency to a wider objective of clarity. This means focusing on what is heard rather than only on what is said, we cannot merely publish and go. As Steve Macklem, my Canadian colleague, says, we should speak as public servants and peers, not as oracles delivering messages from an ivory tower. And effective speaking also requires active listening. At the start of next year, consistent with the ECB endeavors, we will host 
a number of Banque de France listens. I will say it in French, la Banque de France écoute. Such events will happen in all regions to hear what French citizens and SMEs think about inflation and monetary policy. We will then adjust our communication depending on what we hear. Let me elaborate on the economic stakes of this communication. Our inflation targeting policy will be significantly more efficient if economic agents, be they households or businesses, do actually understand this targeting policy, accept it and believe it. Understand, accept, believe. Hence, our inflation targeting policy should be seen as clear, understand, legitimate, accept and credible, believe. I insisted earlier on clarification in my second question. Let me now conclude with legitimacy and credibility. One of the most difficult challenges for a central bank with a price stability mandate is how to explain a positive inflation objective above zero. The general public often does not understand why a central bank should deliberately try to increase inflation. We need to explain better that also our price stability objective is defined on terms of HICP inflation, so consumer prices. We are actually seeking a general average increase in all nominal variables, including wages and nominal GDP. Few people spontaneously want an increase in consumer prices, but most do want, do want an increase in their nominal incomes. To a non-economist, price stability would often imply targeting zero inflation. However, we need to explain why targeting zero inflation is not ideal, far from ideal. Real wage adjustment can be necessary to maintain competitiveness and sustain employment. And this real adjustment is easier to achieve with a positive inflation rate. Still more, the effective lower bound ELB or nominal interest rates would also be reached more frequently, putting a constraint on the use of monetary policy. We all know that, but I do acknowledge that using the ELB argument in, say, a family lunch on Sunday is easier said than done. Last but not least, credibility. Here, households and firms have mixed feelings. They believe that actual inflation is much higher than central banks and statistics institutes claim. And they doubt that we will deliver the close to 2% in the future. Distrust is too often the name of the game. Here, let us again listen and speak. First, listen to the inflation expectations of households and firms. We don't measure them properly today, although they are of the essence for economic transmission of monetary policy, as households and firms are the actual price setters and wage setters. Indeed, their price expectations are quite different from those of financial markets we tend to focus on. Listen and then speak. Once a central bank has committed to a target, it must use every tool available to deliver on it. And it must explain clearly that the transmission of the monetary impulse to the economy entails some delays. We are all convinced that a credible inflation objective makes stabilizing inflation easier because the objective anchors inflation expectations. Let us convince our fellow citizens of our determination in plain language. I hope my remarks today help somewhat to initiate this essential debate we will have to conduct and to conclude 
in our ECB strategic review. Thank you for your attention. Governor, thank you very much indeed. There's, uh, it, I have to show here that I have been actively listening. Philippe Écoute, because there is a tremendous <laughs> it's a, amount. It's a good start for Banque de France Écoute. <laughs> There's a tremendous amount in there to, to, to unpick in terms of uh, uh, inflation targeting objectives. I'm particularly impressed by the thinking that's going on in Banque de France about communication. Uh, and indeed how central bankers communicate with citizens is going to be absolutely crucial if uh, central bank digital currency is going to succeed or fail. Uh, enormous amount of uh, there to unpick as well in terms of establishing uh, credibility and so forth. I'm, I'm looking forward, I think, uh, with impatience to the ECB uh, report on, on, on its strategic review. Uh, this is going to provoke an, an enormous amount of debate. I'd like, if I may, to turn a little towards the digitization piece. Please. You emphasized at the start that the whole uh, banking system was being challenged by the digital economy, amongst other things. And you gave fascinating speech, very insightful speech in Berlin a couple of weeks ago, in which you said, um, if I may quote myself, quote you, that central banks cannot allow ourselves to lag behind on central bank digital currency. Um, and yet observers might say that both the ECB and indeed the Fed um, are marking their time here whilst the um, People's Bank of China on the one hand and Big Tech Silicon Valley on the other uh, are, are racing ahead. Uh, do you think we're leaving it a little late? Uh, I don't think so. Uh, allow me perhaps two short remarks about digitalization and we will discuss it further this morning. Uh, first, the effects of digitalization are not only CDBC, if I may, uh, and to give only one obvious example, what is the role uh, of digitalization in the so-called lowflation we observed in the last years, and not only in Europe, worldwide? And probably the combined effects of digitalization and globalization, I insist on the combination, uh, is a rather strong one uh, on the disinflationary trends we saw. And we will have to study that also in our strategy review. Uh, on CDBC, uh, we don't lag behind. As a matter of fact, we created, uh, under Christine Lagarde's sponsorship, the so-called high-level task force at the start of this year. And we are about to publish its report, probably in the coming weeks or even days. Uh, and I think it's uh, it's a very accurate and complete report, uh, putting all the grounds uh, to go forward, uh, all the reasons to go forward uh, for CDBC, and also all the questions associated with CDBC. So I repeat what I said in Berlin, we will not lag behind. Uh, but it has to be combined also with private sector initiative, and it has to be consistent with our monetary policy and financial stability objectives. But uh, if I look at the way this idea of central bank digital currency developed, let's say in the last 12 months, uh, I think the acceleration is quite impressive, and we don't lag behind in any measure. Believe me. Well, certainly nobody could accuse the Banque de France of lagging behind. You have No, no, but a... my, Philip, I see your point, and thank you. I do appreciate for all the Banque de France staff, but my remark and my commitment is for the whole euro system and the CB. But you had, the Banque de France has done a, completed a very successful experiment in stablecoin with the uh, Société Générale. You've just allowed a whole raft of experiments. Uh, could you share with us any important lessons that you've learned so far? Uh, we were among the first, indeed, to launch an experiment of 
on wholesale central yep. bank digital currency. Uh, we don't call it stablecoin because stablecoin probably refers to something different from, from big text, but also to, to, to be considered unregulated. Uh, and for us, it was a very interesting start. So we decided to open this experiment and we have picked after an appel d'off, so it was an open competition. Mm -hmm. We have picked eight other projects uh, focused at this stage on wholesale uh, central bank digital currency, where we will learn much. Uh, and we all know that uh, wholesale settlements between financial institutions on financial markets are at present in central bank currency and should remain, whatever the technology is, in central bank digital currency. This is a matter of trust and of financial stability. Uh, but beside all sales, central bank digital currency, we will have to accelerate and probably experiment on retail central bank digital currency for the broad public. It raises other stakes and other questions too. And our uh, Eurosystem report from this high level task force will be focused on retail central bank digital currency. How do you think the the, Europe, the European Central Bank in particular, but also clearly the Banque de France and others, are going to engage the public in this debate around, uh, around digital currency? You, you mentioned earlier in your speech that communication between central banks at the moment largely is focused or directed very largely at expert audiences like, like, like this one. Um, and I, we know from our research at OMFIF that the average citizen really does not understand the difference between M0 and M1 um, and is going to be thoroughly confused initially by digital currency if, if it arrives. How, how will central banks go about uh, dealing with this? Um, the if you stressed is important. It's not, not yet decided. Uh, again, uh, we accelerated and we will study and then, then decide. But probably the message to the broad public should not be about the difference in the M0 and M1. Uh, I, I don't think it's that important today. But we should at least explain two or three important things and pillars of trust. First, that any evolution of the form of central bank currency uh, will be consistent with long-term values like price stability, financial stability and trust. Yes, and this will not change the rule of the game. Uh, completely consistent with the treaties to, to, to say an obvious but important thing. Uh, another important message will be about complementarity because Sometimes the public debate tends to oversimplify and to oppose. And to give an obvious example, to say it's the choice will be between cash, banknotes, and central bank digital currency. It will not be an or. If we introduce a central bank digital currency, it will not meet the disparation of cash. This is very important. People will have the choice. And it's two ways of accessing central bank currency. Uh, and so our commitment to, to, to cash should be extremely clear. Another simplistic opposition is the opposition between the public initiative from our side, central bank digital currency, and private sector initiative. Let me give an example in Europe. There is this very interesting initiative by European Bank called EPI, European Payments Initiative. We do support it. We do support it. We need a pan-European solution for payments with a strong involvement of commercial banks. And personally, I see no opposition at all between EPI and CDBC. On the contrary, there are many ways of complementarity. So this should be very important messages also for the broad public. They will keep their bank accounts. And let me say it 
as simple as that. Uh, and then we will have to adjust the message to the precise content, timing, and modalities of the decision. We are not yet there. But let us explain the purpose. Uh, it's part, it's another possible form of a general value uh, or, or a pillar of, of confidence in our economies, uh, which is the stability of our currency. And it's broad access, it's broad access. Clearly, and the impacts on financial stability as well that, uh, that you mentioned. Um, Governor, and let that me, has if you been... allow me, Philip, the impact on financial stability is also linked to this issue of complementarity uh, between a possible, I stress possible, central bank digital currency and commercial banks. Yes. Uh, as you mentioned, that we, we have a complex multifaceted system, and you stress very strongly that we should not be undermining that, rather, we should be uh, mo moving it forward. It's not that complex, but it's efficient, and it will remain efficient. <laughs> Governor, you have covered a tremendous amount of ground uh, uh, this morning. Um, very, very much indeed. Um, we're very, very grateful to both you and the Banque de France for uh, kicking this debate off, for giving us so much to chew about. Just before we go and I hand over Thierry, uh, we have a poll uh, for our audience, uh, which is we would uh, ask audience participants to vote on by pressing the buttons on the appropriate buttons on their computer, uh, which is coming up in progress, which is uh, should central banks issue a digital currency? Question um, mark. And make please whatever assumptions you like about this. Uh, should central banks issue a digital currency? Select one of yes, no, and not yet. Uh, and uh, my, my colleague Thierry will give us the results a little later. So it remains for me. Uh, for the moment to again thank the Governor of the Banque de France uh, very deeply for an excellent address. Thank you Governor for, for, for getting us going uh, and with that I will hand over to uh, Thierry Baudouin who's the Director of Digital Transformation at the Banque de France uh, and his panel who will take us to the next stage of this seminar uh, and I shall return later. Thank you. Thank you. Merci. Have a good morning. Merci. Au revoir. Hello. Yes. Uh, yes. Can you hear me? Can you? Moi, je vous écoute parfaitement. I I hear you perfectly. Okay, so good morning everybody. So uh, I'm happy to join you and to to open the, the panel on innovation uh, in the financial sector and on the, the COVID-19 implications. So we, we are going to have an overview of the state of digitalization, as you say, uh, and the new challenges for the financial industry and on the role of central banks uh, in preparing for the future. So uh, um, I think that uh, we will have the, the, the results uh, on the poll on CBDC quite soon. But before that, I would like to uh, uh, say maybe a, a few words about digital transformation. And uh, of course, because uh, digitalization uh, diffuses into the financial industry uh, and not only through, through currency. So, um, the digital transformation has been uh, well underway for several years already, and especially in the financial sector. Um, so is the COVID crisis uh, an accelerator uh, that forces us to deploy digital processing fully? Uh, you, you surely know the, the famous joke uh, among the CEO, the CDO, and the COVID, uh, which one led the best to the digital transformation? And I'm afraid I think that the, the COVID uh, is really the winner. <laughs> so, uh, but uh, has the, the world really changed? Uh, so many articles and forums on uh, all economic sectors. 
uh, say that uh, there is a potential long-term disruptive effect on the way uh, uh, our society, society operates. Uh, and the goal of uh, our conversation uh, uh, this morning so is to identify the way of understanding uh, what is underway and identify the lessons for the future. So is the financial industry going to change? Uh, if yes, how? Uh, during the breakdowns, the priority was to keep the services provided functioning. Today, we need to continue living with the virus. And what are the new challenges, the new opportunities, uh, the new risks that are in front of us? So we have a fantastic panel today with great speakers to address this, sub sub this topic, this subject. Let me uh, introduce uh, all of them. Uh, I will start with Marianne. Marianne Torde is the Director of Public and European Affairs at uh, France Digital. So France Digital is an association created in uh, 2012 uh, that represents uh, uh, more than 1,800 startups and more than 150 investors members. So uh, it is the leading organization of startups in Europe. So France Digital is working on all aspects uh, concerning startups, uh, such as uh, tax, financing, uh, platform worker status, uh, artificial intelligence, blockchain, competition, and so on. So Marianne is also a, a tax lawyer and took part in the definition of the blockchain regulation in France. So good morning, Marianne. Hello, everyone. I go to Pietro, Pietro Grassano, who is Business Solution Director for Europe at Algorand, a blockchain technology company. So Algorand uh, develops an open, permissionless, uh, proof-of-stake blockchain uh, without forking uh, that provides security, scalability, and decentralization schemes. So Pietro uh, knows very well the financial sector. Uh, he has an experience of several years in the banking industry and in particular in asset management sector. Thank you, everybody. G good morning, uh, Pietro. So, um, uh, Dirk uh, uh, Schrader, good morning, Dirk. He's deputy head of the payment and settlement systems department at the Deutsche Bundesbank. So he worked on the different market infrastructures, uh, focusing first on the individual payment system like uh, RTGS Plus, and then on the target to project. Uh, his activities also include collaborating with the banking industry in uh, political issues, uh, for instance, regarding with SEPA, uh, and with other central banks uh, at G10 and, and uh, EU levels. So Dirk represents the Bundesbank in the Payment and Settlement System Committee of the ESCB, the European System of Central Banks, and has chaired the CPSS Working Group on Innovations in Retail Payment. Thank you, thank you, Dirk, to, to join for this panel. Bonjour. Uh, and <laughs> bonjour. And then I go to uh, Olivier, Olivier Flisch. He's the director of uh, FinTech Innovation at the ACPR, which is a French banking and insurance supervisory authority linked to Banque de France. He's in charge of the FinTech Hub. So the FinTech Hub uh, serves as a single point of entry for financial innovative project holders in the banking and insurance uh, sectors and uh, coordinates with the Banque de France and the French Financial Market Supervisory Authorities, AMF. And together with AMF, uh, uh, he has set up the FinTech Forum. The FinTech Forum is a body for consultation and dialogue with the French FinTech industry in France. Uh, Olivier is also responsible for the SubTech uh, mission of the ACPR which aims at building on innovative technologies to improve the tools used uh, for supervisory purpose. Good morning, Olivier. Good morning, Thierry. <laughs> okay, I, 
I will start uh, with uh, uh, the panel with some questions for you. And uh, uh, I propose to start uh, with uh, the first question to Marianne. So, uh, Marianne, uh, like the economy as a whole, uh, the innovator ecosystem has faced radical change. And France Digital has supported startups uh, by offering what you call survival kits to help them better manage breakdown and exit of this. So what are the, the first lessons that France Digital has learned from this initiative? Well, uh, thank you for inviting me to this panel. And well, the, the lesson that we learned in the crisis that we all went through is that French and EU institutions can act quickly and take uh, unprecedented measures to support companies. And when I say companies, I, I also mean startups and VCs, because as you mentioned, we represent both startups and VCs, so venture capital funds. And we had to, to make uh, one, one big issue for us was to, to make our decision makers understand that startups have specific features and need adapted measures and instruments to be granted help. And for instance, uh, a major instrument implemented by, by the banks and, and the French government was the state guaranteed loans. But uh, state guaranteed loans, also known as a prêt garanti par l'État in French, um, suppose that you turn to your bank to be granted money. In fact, startups mostly do not turn to the bank to be granted money, they turn to the VCs. And the reason for that is quite simple, is because they invest in talents, they invest in research and development, and so they do not have the balance sheet that is well featured and, and well fitted to be granted a loan. So it, our job and, and the lesson that we that we learned and we that we had to make learn is that um, we the, the, the banks and the government had to understand that they had to, to work together and possibly reverse the decision making process and have the government first guarantee the potential loan, loan and then um, the bank would go with the, with, the, with the guarantee and grant loans to, to startups. And that was quite um, a success because we, we had a poll uh, published uh, in, 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 in September and that uh, mentioned that 83% startups used uh, state guaranteed loans. So that was a great lesson and it could be uh, uh, engaged a bit further after that. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Marianne. Um, uh, do you think that the, the situation uh, is also an opportunity for innovative players uh, to be able to go further uh, into digital transformation, take the opportunity for growth? Yeah, sure. Um, well, uh, the government governor said that we had uh, uh, we engaged into dig digitalization, but it's true we we all faced a, a great leap forward with regards to digitalization. Merchants, individuals, companies, and of course innovative players. We all realized that we needed digital devices, and applied to the financial sector. It means that we used contactless payment online banking, online lending platforms. We used deferred payment or payment in several installments. And so we all faced the fact that humans were no longer able to have and provide one-to-one -one advice or financial services. So that being said, we, we, we understand that startups have and find fintech uh, startups have a role to play in the in the in the next uh, in the in the next uh, months or in the in the next years, and so is this whole situation an opportunity? Yes, of course, as long as the government, the EU institutions, and most broadly, public and private sectors engaged into this digital acceleration and their digital transformation. Yeah. Okay, and uh, uh, maybe another question: Do you do do, do you think that uh, a, a, a new type of partnership between uh, startups and uh, large companies uh, to take advantage of the transformation momentum uh, given by the, the COVID crisis is uh, could be a, an opportunity? 
Sure. Uh, in fact, uh, it was the major pain point for startups during the crisis. Um, we we have a, an annual barometer that uh, to 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 understand what's the state of startups uh, every year, and um, and this year for the first time, uh, the major pain point for startup was the fact that um, they needed to they needed corporates. To, to be clients. Um, startups need three things. They need finance, finance, they need talents, and they need clients. And the corporates have a, a role to play for that. And what I want to say is that we have a lot of technologies. We have AI, we have blockchain, and it will be um, discussed further. We have cybersecurity, we have quantum computing. All those technologies need to be seen as an opportunity and not a threat for corporates and for the public sector as well. And so startups have a, are part of the solution. They can help and, and uh, engage into an access and, and help corporates accelerate their digital transformation. So we are here if they, they want to, to engage in a, in a matchmaking with startups. We have a lot of uh, fintech startups being uh, uh, at France Digital, so do not hesitate to contact us. Okay, uh, okay. So you're, you're surely right. All these technologies, uh, if you have a, an overlook, uh, in fact, are going in the same way. So they just foster uh, a new kind of uh, economy of services uh, to develop between the different actors, and uh, probably it's a real opportunity for startups, fintech to take the advantage of this technology to take a place uh, in this new economy of services. So thanks, uh, thanks a lot, uh, Marianne. Maybe just uh, before uh, uh, going on in the discussion, I can give you the, the results of the poll regarding CBDC. So um, uh, I think that 66% uh, uh, of, of uh, the attendees say yes, uh, we need a CBDC. Uh, 6% only say no, and 28% say, uh, say uh, not yet. <laughs> so there is a, a huge interest in, uh, in CBDC, and uh, of course maybe the not yet uh, show that there are some uh, questions still, uh, still open on CBDC. Uh, okay, uh, probably we will uh, we will have the discussion on CBDC during the panel and see what are these, uh, these questions that are still open and uh, 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 why is it interesting to go to go to a CBDC. So um, uh, thank you to, to all of you for uh, answering very quickly to this uh, to this uh, to this poll. Um, okay, I maybe I go to to Olivier uh, Olivier Olivier Flisch from the ACPR. So, Olivier, uh, um, from the point of view of the regulator and supervisor, so how innovative players uh, and fintech in France reacted to the crisis? Yes, thank you, Thierry. Um, I would say um, for for the beginning of the crisis, because the crisis is not is not over. But um, I think the, the innovative players, uh, players reacted well. Uh, of course, I don't have any figures to explain this, but I've got a few, um, a few signals which shows that uh, the, the reaction was quite, uh, um, quite good or quite resilient. The, the first thing is we had the ACPR, so we've got a FinTech Innovation Hub, which is the gateway to, to innovative project holders. So that's very early in the project but we 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 have contacts on on project uh, at the beginning of the project and what we saw uh, during the the break uh, the lockdown is that the number of contacts did, didn't decrease actually people uh, went on having projects so that's a first signal which shows that uh, the ecosystem was still uh, was still vivid i would say um the second uh, second uh, signal, I would say, is of course uh, the fact that some business models were um, obviously boosted by the fact that uh, we had all to uh, to use re remote financial services. 
So a part of the of the business model were boosted, and two two figures can illustrate this uh, very simply. Contactless payments increased by uh, 65% um, in 2020 compared with uh, 2019 at this uh, point in time. And payments for e-trade um, on e-trade platform and losses increased by 25%. So you can see that the crisis had, um, uh, had a mixed impact on the, the, the ecosystem because some of the, the, the business models were reinforced by, by the crisis. However, um, I would say we have to be very careful because of course uh, the innovative ecosystem is composed of startups or very young companies, so they are potentially more fragile. And some models are exposed to, to a global uh, economic downtown, uh, turn down, sorry, crisis. And as I, I said uh, at the beginning, the crisis is not, is not over. So we, we clearly, we, we need, we don't have the hindsight yet to be very uh, um, uh, to, to state exactly to to understand exactly all the consequences, all the implication of the of the crisis. Um, actually, I would say we, we uh, at the ACP we've got one question now: is uh, the ecosystem was quite resilient to the first shock? Uh, the question now is, will the ecosystem keep the momentum in 2021? Um, and especially, you mentioned um, the, the role of large players, large banks, which have a role to play in the ecosystem. And the question is, will they be tempted to postpone innovative projects because they will find, they will say, well, this is, uh, this is not the priority, we have to manage the, the economic crisis. Or will they keep their own momentum? Because if they keep their own momentum, this will be a signal for the rest of the, the fintech, and probably this will be a very positive signal. Uh, however, I'm I'm sure in the medium term that the stake of digitalization are too high in the financial mm -hmm. sector, uh, very high, and so um, the industry's innovation and transformation will not stop. Uh, in 2021, and we have to anticipate um, further developments. Okay, and uh, thank you, uh, uh, Olivier. Do you think that uh, all these startups companies are quite uh, optimistic now uh, in the situation, or or or, or, or quite uh, uh, fragile in, in their way? Well. Um, at least the fintech we 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 meet are um, still you, you know well, fintechs are very often startups and startups believe in their projects uh, so the fintech we see have uh, real projects uh, they want to 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 to, um, to develop and i would say yes they, they are still optimistic yeah. That, that, but that's a feeling. I mean, I can't. Uh, <laughs> okay, good news. Um, yeah. another, another question, Olivier. Uh, what has changed uh, in the supervisor's mission uh, during the breakdown? Yeah, well, uh, I, I would say during the breakdown, the first thing was uh, we had also to be reactive. That's, uh, that's obvious. And um, I say maybe three, three things. The, the first point is we adapted very quickly uh, to massive teleworking. Then, thanks to the tool put in place uh, at the Banque de France, so, uh, uh, that we, we could uh, shift, I would say we could, um, actually we could carry out all of our tasks, except maybe on-site inspection where we had to find, of course, other solution because we couldn't go on site. So the first thing is we were able to, to react very quickly and to adapt to, to this new organization. Of course, then we, we put a lot of effort into the monitoring and management of the, the risk related to, to the particular economic situation. I mean, we had to, uh, to, to monitor the situation. Um, we, and of course, responsiveness is key. I mean, we, we had really to be, to be reactive. Um, 
it, it was very important for us to to to, to monitor the, the situation, to to have contacts with uh, with large banks, large interests, to to follow the the risk and also to to make uh, stress tests. Um, the third point I would say uh, is that, uh, and I think it's also very important, is we also conducted the risk of our task. That is to say, those of the long for the longer term, because it's very important to to keep on preparing the future. And for example, at the innovation, uh, the fintech innovation, we we were able to complete our AI study or study on on artificial intelligence where we conducted workshops, so online workshops with voluntary bankers and interns during the lockdown. Uh, and this under very satisfactory conditions. So I would say if I had to lesson to draw for the supervisor in from this period, it would be the following. We, the crisis has shown how important it is to, to, to be very well connected to the whole financial ecosystem. And this is not only innovative ecosystem, that's all the ecosystem. Uh, so for, of course, for, for me, it's fintechs, but it's also traditional players for credential supervision, um, partner supervisor. It was very important in this time to, to be very well connected with European supervisors, with, Euro, with other French supervisors, and of course, regulators. We are really to, uh, to, to, to to have an action inserted in a, into a global support to the economy. And this is important because we, we need to ensure not only the resilience of this or that individual financial player, but we need to, 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 to ensure or to contribute to the resilience of the entire ecosystem. And this, um, this implies that we, we have to be connected. And the second thing I think um, we learned from the crisis, uh, although we already knew uh, this a little bit, but we 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 have of course to to stay prepared, and this is an operational issue for supervisors and a question of tools, um, because we, we need tools to be and we need tools that can be quickly mobilized. So of course that that's that's first the tools for communication. We have to to have resident communication tools but also we, we have to be able to access to data. We have also to, to have better analytical tools. Well, we really use stress test tools during the crisis and these type of tools are very important. So I would say stay connected and have the, the, the proper tool to, to be prepared. Okay, Olivier, and uh, where are you ready to, to, uh, to fulfill all your mission in a digital way at the beginning of the crisis? Yes, we were thanks to the Bank of France. Yeah, we, okay. <laughs> we had thanks. wonderful tools for this. <laughs> okay, good. Thank you, uh, thank you, uh, Olivier. Uh, um, uh, uh, Dirk, um, uh, this question for you now. Um, we know that uh, the structures, the structure of payments, has profoundly modified during the, the, the COVID crisis. And uh, I know that in France, for example, banknotes uh, withdrawals fell by 50% in volume and 40% in value. Uh, in, on, the, on the payment side, we, we can see that uh, in Europe, we face also some strategic choice, choice quite urgently. Uh, what is your vision for the future of, uh, of the, in the field of payment? What are the future developments in, uh, in the field of payments? Yeah, thank you very much, uh, Thierry. Uh, so, um, when you have uh, visions or ask for visions, then you have to go to the doctor. That was a saying of the former <laughs> chancellor. So, don't uh, ask a central banker for visions. No, but um, uh, I think you rightly pointed out that uh, COVID-19 has um, accelerated the developments. And um, I think it is um, first and foremost important to say that the payment uh, landscape was fully functioning uh, also in the times of crisis. I think that is important when we look at all the challenges uh, central banks, but also banks, service providers, um, with the challenges of, of uh, teleworking, I think that was uh, quite good. And uh, um, although uh, COVID-19 is um, um, a very sad and perhaps 
bad development, uh, I think that is at least, I would say, something which you uh, could uh, positively uh, take from, from that crisis. That being said, um, I think first it is important that we see uh, the trend towards cashless payments also in former years. Uh, when you look at the figures for uh, 2019, for example, we had a plus of 20% in cards in Germany, and you know Germany is not uh, yet uh, uh, so um, uh, at the top regarding the cash usage. So uh, that is what, what we see. That is, uh, uh, for example, uh, due to uh, the contactless technology that are the same developments uh, we see. And for sure, the increasing number of e-commerce payments, the whole digitalization, the use of biometrics, of smart devices, that all changes the situation. And that has already been uh, detected, uh, I think, at least in 2019. Now the corona crisis, I think, has served as an accelerator. Um, although um, I think it's currently not so clear what is the quantitative effect on top of the general developments we have seen in the past. And also the question, are there permanent developments or is it just a temporary? I think our um, anecdotal evidence would say if people would now move to contactless payments, they will not come back. But, you know, it's uh, not always so difficult to predict what uh, human beings uh, have done in Germany, but I think also in other countries, we have also increased um, the uh, limit uh, for um, non-PIM payments uh, from 25 to 50 euros. I think that also have, has helped because in the end, uh, I think it's quite clear uh, for, the, for the consumer, um, what counts are uh, perhaps safety, but cost, convenience, speed, that are the, the points. And therefore, I think um, also the, the increasing limit uh, uh, was, was really good. On the other hand, um, I think cash remains, at least in Germany, substantial. Um, there are still seven out of 10 transactions uh, at the POS uh, uh, made in cash. And uh, for sure, the huge question is, will we uh, still see an evolutionary development, perhaps a little bit more accelerated, say two or three percentage points, perhaps uh, decreasing cash per year, or will we see a development like, I think in Sweden and also in the Netherlands, where we had in four years, a reduction of uh, 20 percentage points. And the question is, is COVID-19 the tipping point for that? or uh, uh, can we continue with those evolutionary developments? But for sure, with regard to the vision, um, I would like to outline perhaps four points. First, the vision um, uh, or, or the future payment landscape will be digital. Uh, what a surprise. <laughs> um, second, I believe it will be more instant, uh, not only because the commission is asking for that and the euro system but I think there is also um, the foundation, the basis for new products, for better products, for even more convenience, and also for value add. Because as I said, what is the trigger to convince people uh, to, to switch or to, to use other products? It's the convenience, so value add is quicker, it is easier. So that I think will be a cornerstone for the future landscape um, in, in payments. The third question or the third issue, and that is uh, perhaps something which is uh, not so clearly decided. I think there are two models. Um, the one is the platform model, where you have a low number of providers providing big ecosystems where payments and financial services are an integral part, or that is the alternative, and I personally believe that is the better one. That is an open, innovative, cooperative ecosystem of players, of for sure established players, of uh, uh, fintechs working together, um, trying uh, uh, to, to create a web, an ecosystem which really provides value, which ensures um, um, cost-efficient payments. And that is also quite clear, such an ecosystem will only be a pan-European one. 
And that is the reason why we believe that the payment market as it is, but also Finn, they would have to uh, look at pan-European solutions. I think we do not, uh, we, we did not start at SEPA just for credit transfers and direct debits. We now see that a number of new digital schemes, products are on the market, but they are fragmented, perhaps not even uh, uh, um, rolled out nationwide, but in a, um, I, I'm, I'm not aware that there are so many innovations which are rolled out at pan-European basis. And therefore, I think that is really important that we make progress because otherwise, I think we will automatically end up in the situation where we will be in the end confronted with uh, a number of, of uh, with a few platforms that I think is, is not um, um, healthy competition in the end. So our plea is open ecosystem, uh, work together, cooperate, uh, create pan-European solutions for payments. That is what counts. And the, the fourth point, and that is perhaps a little bit uh, the um, uh, uh, restriction which we have, that is for sure cyber. I think uh, it can only work if we can ensure that there is security, sufficient security for sure. You cannot always uh, avoid that there will be uh, problems or incidents, but I think you, we must invest perhaps more in cybersecurity and also the COVID-19 crisis has shown that um, uh, cyber uh, um, uh, attacks might become uh, even more uh, substantial in, in the future. With home working, you know that uh, the circumstances are different, so you have a number of uh, additional pain points which, which might be attacked. So that, that are all things which we have to uh, take into consideration because otherwise all the investments will not work. <clears throat> Okay, thank you, uh, thank you, uh, Dirk. Um, uh, uh, coming back to CBDC uh, debate, so do you think that a new form of currency uh, will emerge in the coming years, and what uh, will be the place in the payment landscape? Ah, Thierry, that is now <laughs> a question. So how many <laughs> minutes do I have? 20 minutes, 25 minutes? <laughs> so uh, I think... Short term, uh, Fred. Yeah, no. I think, um, and here you get the expert view, so that is important uh, because here you really get what, what I believe. So the, the first question, uh, you say, do you expect a new currency? Um, CBDC is in my point of view, or the discussion on that is nothing, has nothing to do with a new currency. So if you talk of a currency, you might talk of bitcoins, uh, uh, Tether, or I don't know, so more crypto assets. Um, here, I think my position is, no, I don't expect it because I believe money is trust and trust is that what a central bank or that what the central banks should provide. I do not believe that uh, you can say that the technology um, is the better central banker. And I have the feeling sometimes this is what is behind. And also when you look at um, the um, uh, uh, current um, system solutions, I think they are not really convincing, neither in uh, terms of uh, uh, providing a stable uh, uh, store of value, nor an efficient means of uh, uh, transaction. So that, that is one thing that is the easy part. Now the more difficult part is the CBDC part. And uh, uh, you have uh, uh, made this wonderful uh, a poll. 66% think, yeah, we need CBDC. So I'm a little bit more skeptical. And you know, I have a, quite a long experience in payments dating back to 2000. So, so I always uh, uh, remember a little bit the discussion on e-money, 1996, 1997. And what we have seen afterwards, that was not so promising. So for CBDC, for sure, there is a potential because otherwise, I hope at least there is potential because more than 70 central banks work, uh, worldwide uh, um, care with this uh, topic. So I hope that uh, there could be a, a potential. 
But uh, what what we have to uh, uh, really look at is, I think we cannot uh, discuss on a very generic level. Uh, you cannot ask ah, for policy reasons because in China it can't now. I think we have to go a little bit deeper into detail, and we have to uh, ask three questions: For what do we do that? That is, I think, one of the key questions. And here, I think we always get a little bit into uh, uh, trouble because Pietro will perhaps say, "Yes, we need it because we believe that future solutions will be blockchain-based." Fine, might be. Well, I, I will not comment on that. Okay, and we need cash on the ledger, and we need CBDC. Okay. So, but when you look in the discussion, you have a number. Of additional arguments. Uh, some central banks like Sweden say we would like uh, to create, I would say, uh, something um, if cash will be less important. So we need a complement or not a substitute because cash will be there, but a complement owing to the fact that cash uh, uh, gets uh, more and more uh, um, invisible in, in the economy. And that, I think, is uh, perhaps not a question of, of technology, blockchain technology. Here you could also easily think that this is a kind of e-money provided on cards uh, uh, issued by the central bank. So we see there are a lot of different use cases. And now the next use case is improving cross-border payments, where there are pain points. Um, um, so th there are a number of different uh, possibilities, um, but here I would say also we, we would have to ask, is that is CBDC really uh, the medicine for that? Um, on the one hand, there are alternatives. Perhaps there might also be digital euros issued by commercial banks. Why not? Huh? Perhaps. Um, but the point is uh, uh, for cross-border payments, for sure, CBDC could be a possibility, but could we also interlink instant payment systems? Because the issue of different currencies remain with CBDC, so we will not solve this, this global problem. And also when, when we look at China, I think that is also a, a very specific market where a lot of um, activity is already in e-money, by two big providers. So simply switching this against CBDC is not a big issue, but our situation, our landscape in Europe is completely different. And I think that are all reflections which we have to uh, take into consideration. And that is only the first act of the story. The second act of the story is what is then our concrete objective? Because the question we need to answer is how will it fit into the given infrastructure and the financial system. Do we think it is only, I would say, a backup mechanism, yeah, which some people can use, which do not have access to, to uh, accounts, to the bank? Or do we think that this will compete with cash, with cards, with instant payments? And then the question is, what is our objective? A market share of 10 percent, 20 percent, 30 percent, 40 percent? Or the third possibility, is it the new backbone infrastructure where banks or other providers could put their uh, services on? And that is extremely uh, important to understand because I have looked up the statistics yesterday. From uh, 13 trillion deposits in Europe, 8 trillion deposits are deposits um, are due on demand. And the question is, if we have a CBDC, do we need zero cards? What does it mean for the banks? What does it mean for their profitability? What does it mean for the business model of, of credit? So you see that is just the second act of the story. We have a third act. And the third act is then, if we are convinced there are good reasons, and there are no alternatives going into that direction. Then we have a clear understanding what we would like to see, how it will fit into the landscape. Then the third question is, do the tools we have, the design, is this capable?
capable of achieving these objectives. Here we discuss limits, interest rates. So could we really achieve or might we end up in a situation where we monopolize the market with CBDC and crowd out instant payments or cards or something like that. So that you see, that is a very thick book. We are just on the first uh, uh, pages. And therefore, I think it is important really um, not uh, to say we stay at the sideline. Yeah, we, we have to take an active approach. We also have to experiment. We have to see what are the different uh, capabilities. But I think it is quite clear, and that is a little bit a concern. Um, also, now, when, when you look at the VIS papers, I have it, uh, a quote from um, uh, the, um, what was it? Um, uh, I think the annual economic report. CBDC an increasingly likely option owing to the fact that more and more people uh, discuss CBDC see, uh, it as an option. And I think here we run a little bit the risk that we have a self-fulfilling uh, prophecy. And as I said, I, I'm not against uh, saying, no, we don't need it at all. I think there are opportunities, but I think we really have to reflect very careful um, on that. And my remarks are mainly for um, uh, the retail CBDC. Uh, for sure, when we discuss CBDC as a possibility to support financial market infrastructure, so wholesale CBDC, when we have professional actors, here I think the consequences are not so severe. That is a different story. Um, and that is also, as Mr. Villeroy, um has, has pointed out, that is at the key of our hearts because all the settlements today uh, with regard to securities, they are in central bank money. They should stay in central bank money, whether in CBDC or whether we are bridging solutions in, in uh, current systems. That I think is, is another point, but that is important for us. But I think um, the, the critical discussion is really on, on retail CBDC mm -hmm. because that is in my opinion really a paradigm change and nobody in 1996 said central banks should issue uh, e-money themselves i have looked at the reports we said oh let's do it via regulation let's do it like stimulation of private market initiative things have changed we have a complete different uh, uh, landscape and environment um, now 25 years later that's quite clear we have big tech activities, we have huge digital platforms, uh, but I think we should really uh, have a close look at, at uh, those issues. Okay, thank you. Uh, thank you very much, dear, for this global view uh, of, the, of the topic and payments and CBDC and all the challenges and question and open question on this, uh, on this topic. But uh, let's go to, to, to Pietro. Uh, good morning, Pietro. So, um, uh, uh, of course, we can see all the, the, the profound changes uh, that are taking place. So, uh, what does a tech company, and uh, I'll go on to the great one, uh, so see the, the ongoing changes? Sure. But uh, I, would do, I would make some, some remarks on this uh, in terms of, uh, first of all, the first thing that comes to my mind when talking about change. Is the, and while addressing to Algorand as a, a tech company, uh, I, I would say that probably the first thing that I can see is uh, a somehow blurred the frontier between what you call financial and what you call technical. And the question I ask myself is, isn't, that, isn't it always been like that, right? Since the, I don't know, the, the, the invention of double entry bookkeeping, uh, isn't it uh, a technical aspect? of finance, right? So we are still probably on the same kind of logic and uh, all the crises that we've been living so far, be it, uh, I don't know, economical crisis, political crisis, the pandemic uh, actually have just been precipitating all this. The second remark I would do is, uh, uh, yes, there is, because of the pandemic, there has been a sort of forced uh, digitalization, right? 
which, by the way, showed something that I find uh, pretty remarkable, which is the resiliency of the digital infrastructure. So within a pandemic, uh, with uh, all the lockdowns, uh, with all the frontiers blocked and so on and so forth, we are now doing a webinar via the digital infrastructure, right? Isn't it a testament to the resilience of the digital infrastructure? Of course, I mean, there, in this change, there are winners and losers, right? So it's not uh, a, a, a sort of neutral, uh, positive uh, position. The change happens uh, at uh, a quicker pace. Generally speaking, the middlemen have to show the reason of their added value because there is no more slack, right? So there is a pressure on the middle. And they are doing it essentially in two ways. I see, generally speaking, in finance. On one end, doing the same thing better, so with logics of uh, business process re-engineering. We had uh, an interesting use case recently with an Italian company, Blockchain Italia, that actually has been uh, uh recording and notarizing their own procedure for the approval of their balance sheet on the blockchain right benefiting from a specific article of uh, an italian decree uh, giving legal finality to uh, this sort of procedure uh, so they are doing the same thing only they are doing it uh, uh, quicker uh, and uh, with uh, actually less cost at the end of the day and we are seeing on the other end uh, the companies uh, in the financial world being pushed to do new things that are actually allowed uh, from the new infrastructure that is uh, that is available. Uh, just to, to, to take a little bit the, 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 the provocation that DRK uh, gave me, right, saying, okay, Pietro is going to say this and this and that. Uh, while I, I, I fully agree on the fact that uh, all decisions about CBDC need to be very thoughtful and need to account both for uh, the plus, the minus, the pros and cons and so on, I think that a, a, a specific element that comes from the theory of systems uh, need to be taken into account. Actually, blockchain here can become an infrastructure uh, at the service of the overall financial industry, both uh, at the service of the central banks, uh, of the traditional banking sectors, of the new business models, because of its decentralized nature, it becomes a tool in order to prevent bubble spending by design. You don't have the single point of failure in the infrastructure, right? Uh, all infrastructure, working infrastructure through time, have actually the same kind of characteristics. They are, they are efficient, right? A road, a bridge, a railway, the internet, you know, have to be efficient in the sense that they have to solve a problem. So we don't need to be a solution searching for a problem, but on the other way around, the a road wants to bring you from point A to point B. They also need to be accessible in terms of costs in terms of uh, technical ability to access and i'm not saying that blockchain is immediately accessible to everybody and at the end of the day they also need to be secure you don't go on a road if you risk to be robbed you don't go on a bridge if you think that it's going to fall down right so you have these three things the efficiency the uh, accessibility and and the security and i think that by design the novelty represented by a well-functioning blockchain that solves the problems of previous uh, uh, protocols is actually the fact of giving out these three things and this doesn't prevent a central bank to use this infrastructure in order to fulfill the duties and the mandate of a central bank right you still have the, can have the control of the monetary policy you can have the control even a better control of the know your client anti-money laundering logic. So there are new things that can be done. Uh, the ease of tokenization, the truly atomic transactions that allow to decrease the, uh, the, the, the counterparty risk, which is a big element, right? We've been living uh, all through the 2007, 2008 uh, crisis with all the contagion effects. Just imagine 
an infra a financial infrastructure with the traceability given by a blockchain uh, protocol. Well, the contagion effort could have been somehow uh, managed a little bit differently. So I would say that there are these elements, right? And new things that mm, can be done, old things that can be done better. And at the end of the day, this change, uh, I mean, I think that the blockchain uh, overall, a well-functioning blockchain, is actually one of the uh, way out from the crisis. Innovation is one of the way out from the top, right, through increased productivity from, uh, from the crisis. Otherwise, I mean, from uh, a debt crisis, you can just uh, get out uh, with uh, hyperinflation, with uh, prolonged austerity, with uh, a bankruptcy, or with growth. Innovation can play that role. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Pietro. So we understand that the blockchain technologies are more and more mature. Uh, of course, they are resilient by design and uh, secured also by design and uh, they offer new uses. Uh, however, um, there are still uh, some points that probably have to be resolved, uh, just like privacy, interoperability and also uh, acceptability. Um, uh, how do you see the, 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 the evolution on, uh, on this topic and uh, will this pain po point will be, uh, will be solved in the future? Can, can I ask you uh, uh, to define um, for me acceptability? Oh, yes, uh, acceptability for me and my question was uh, if, you, if you look at the citizen uh, uh, regarding, of course, uh, all the confidence that they can have in systems, in uh, applications, uh, will they be uh, uh, in favor to, to, to use a blockchain uh, as a large scale? You know that this technology is not uh, always uh, easily understandable uh, by the citizen. How can we manage uh, 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 that point for acceptability of the technology uh, viewed by the citizens? Absolutely. Um, yeah, I think that uh, uh, on one end, uh, uh, the evolution of the blockchain industry is going exactly in the direction that you mentioned. So trying to find a balance between the traceability needs, right, which are traceability needs of uh, the regulators as well, right? For uh, the security of the infrastructure, you don't want uh, the infrastructure to become a way of concealing uh, uh, funds of dubious origins, you want to be able to perform money, money laundering, to perform New York. So you want a piece of traceability. At the same time, you want to uh, respect, uh, at least uh, in uh, the uh, European Union, the directives uh, around uh, the uh, uh, privacy, GDPR, for instance, right? Uh, well, we think we have, uh, among other uh, solutions uh, in front of uh, some of the limits of the previous uh, uh, protocols of uh, the legacy protocols uh, we have solutions for instance for the integration of the right to be forgotten within the uh, blockchain logics it's a matter of strategy on the information you put on the blockchain right and it doesn't uh, uh, contradict uh, the idea of a tamper proof register which is, at the end of the day, the backbone of what the blockchain is. The solutions of uh, uh, the problem of inter interoperability can be thought uh, in terms of uh, uh, decentralized token bridges. So one can think in terms of, uh, again, I appreciate the fact that there will be uh, different, uh, potentially different CBDCs because there will be different currencies, right? With different uh, currency areas. And uh, at that stage, uh, you can think of a decentralized token bridge as the way to uh, manage the uh, interoperability between the, the, the various blockchains. When it comes to acceptability, um, well, I think it's a matter of uh, also like in the case of privacy to uh, traceability. It's a matter of stakeholder engagement. And with stakeholder, I mean, of course, uh, the private citizens, uh, the regulators, the companies. So, I mean, today it is perfectly possible to use uh, a wallet uh, on your uh, uh, 
smartphone to go through the metro station, right, to pay the metro in a seamless way. And uh, you are not even asking yourself uh, what uh, is uh, behind the hood. Is it a centralized payment system? Is it a blockchain? What? We don't know, right? Uh, so I, I, I can think that the problem of acceptability can be managed. And of course, uh, the stakeholders, the regulators, uh, um, the, the, the companies, uh, the, 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 the traditional companies can play an important role there. Uh, but at the end of the day, the logic of decentralization can be understood by people. Of course, there must be an element of education. I, I, I appreciate the logic, right, of uh, uh, listening, speaking, right? And then there can be the logic of recording as well the, uh, the questions and the answers. And uh, I think that people can, can perfectly uh, get to, to, to understand that. Decentralization is a sort of act of humility, right? You accept the fact that the center of the house may not know everything. It can happen, right? Once you accept this, there is a whole wealth uh, of, uh, of new opportunities that can arise. Again, I was talking about uh, double entry accounting, right? It was invented in the Italian Renaissance uh, uh, by Fra Luca Pacioli in uh, the 15th century. And of course, uh, it helped the, 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 the Florentine bankers uh, and so on and so forth. We can think uh, with the actual uh, uh, technology available, not only of going real time gross settlement for uh, uh, a wealth of uh, use cases that as of today are still batch end of the day. But we can think of tribal bookkeeping. We can think of transaction where you have uh, uh, the two counterparties and the VAT uh, account taking into consideration the same time. I mean, isn't it in the interest of uh, the mass adoption also from the side of the public sector? So, well, the evolution is going to be, in my opinion, stakeholder engagement and mass adoption. Okay, thank you, Pietro, for this uh, very positive view of the, 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 the power of the technology uh, in innovation. Um, uh, I think that we have uh, uh, time for probably a, a short second round of questions. And I would like to, to, uh, to, 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 to question you about uh, uh, the, the, the source of opportunities. Uh, we know that uh, all crises are sources of opportunities. So what are the future prospects and the transformation driver uh, for, for the financial sector? So um, maybe with a quite short answer because the, 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 yeah. the time is flying. Uh, again, Pietro, to you. So uh, beyond, beyond questions specific to, to blockchain technology, uh, technologies in terms of digitalization what is for you the greatest opportunity for transformation that is available to us in the coming period i think that uh, it's twofold on one end it's the fact of thinking finally in finance as well in terms of infrastructure uh, i've been working in finance for 20 years and actually the logics of infrastructure were taken as a given in the mutual fund industry, you take the payment layer, the transfer agent layer as a given with their own costs, with their own habits, with their own rules and so on. Uh, thinking a bit uh, deeper in terms of infrastructure is a, an important opportunity because you can do better anti-money laundering, because you can finally trace the emissions and in order to fight uh, uh, the greenhouse effect, right? So many different opportunities. And then in terms of collaboration, Right, a, uh, the, the, the idea of uh, a peer-to-peer tamper-proof uh, record, general ledger, right, fosters collaboration inevitably. And uh, actually all the moments in history where there have been uh, paradigm shifts in terms of innovation have been much more open sourced and related to the collaboration of different actors, public, private, and so on, than uh, one thinks uh, in normal times. So these two elements are, to me, the Good. strongest. Thank you. Thank you very much, Pietro. I go to Dirk uh, with, with a question regarding central banks. Um, uh, we have seen that central banks are largely involved in innovation. Uh, in your opinion, what, uh, what is the role of the central bank's uh, innovation centers 
uh, in all the development that you, you have talked about. Yeah, as I said, uh, I think there are two possibilities. Either you look and write interesting papers or you try uh, to experience uh, learning by doing. That does not say that you uh, already create the products, uh, but I think that is really uh, also key for central banks. I'm still convinced that we have to do something practically, that we have to look at the blockchain technology, that we do not uh, only have to look what others write, but that we also take concrete use cases, that we experiment, that we look what does it mean for us, what are the real benefits, what are the options. And therefore, I think um, innovation hubs are really important. Like uh, uh, any other banks, you know, we also have uh, a lot of uh, to do with our uh, uh, traditional uh, systems. So you need something where you have fresh minds, where you can put together resources really to think out of the box. And I think uh, that is the first thing why I believe it is important. Second one, the innovation centers. Uh, we see central banks um, are not, I think, really competing. They are all trying to fulfill their mandates according to their uh, statutes. And therefore, I think it is uh, a good idea really to create synergies, to learn what others are doing, uh, to work together. Uh, so to broaden the experience that is uh, extremely important because um, as Pietro also has said, this is uh, extremely technical uh, when you, uh, you you need specific expertise and therefore I think those innovation hubs like that what we see now with the BIS but also what others uh, do is, is really important. And the third point is in the end I think it should also translate in improving the services of central banks. We already said we have target two securities for DVP settlement. Uh, the global world is really uh, uh, um, seeing uh, this very positively in other countries you don't have uh, those advanced technologies. On the other hand, there might be new opportunities uh, for of blockchain technology. I think not for every use case. I'm not quite sure whether you have to do a uh, payment at the point of saying necessarily using blockchain and as we said for the consumer he does not care. For them it's the cost, the safety and the convenience whether it's instant payments or whether it's CBDC or blockchain, he doesn't care. So, and, but uh, I think for the central banks, it is important. And for example, improving also cross-border uh, uh, payments could also uh, uh, involve central banks, um, um, owing to the fact that a number of central banks have instant payment systems that perhaps also settlement mechanisms might to be uh, adapted. And that I think is, is important and that might also be products which then can be used by other central banks. Why should we reinvent the wheels? The, the, the circumstances are different, but I think there is uh, ample room for cooperation also among central banks. Thank you, Dirk. Oh. Okay, can you hear me? Yes, okay. Thank you very much, Dirk. Uh, shortly, a uh, uh, question to, uh, to Olivier. Uh, what do you think, how do you think uh, the role of, of the supervisor can evolve in the future? And, uh, and how in a, few, in a few words, because the time is flying. Okay, thank, thank you, Thierry. Uh, I think a lot, lot, have, a lot of things have been said um, by, by the, the other colleagues in the panel, which are really echoing what we, we think. Uh, in, in a few words, I, I will say the role of supervisors will evolve and must evolve because, um, uh, because the financial sector is evolving. And we, we have a, a few challenges there. First, we, we should not hinder innovation because we are not able to follow innovation. So we have really to adapt it. Uh, then once we've we've said that we we need to anticipate on new supervisory methods uh, because we, there will be new digitalized processes. I think Petro mentioned the, the the blockchain and the, the possibility of traceability of the blockchain. Well, this is a characteristic we must look into as supervisors, and we must develop tools for that. 
Um, among the key technologies I think we, we should um, master as supervisors is um, I would I would mention three which has been which have been mentioned by Marianne at the very beginning of the panel. It's uh, artificial intelligence, um, blockchain, and cyber security techniques. And there we have to to uh, to to, uh, to go around uh, along the learning curves. And to do this, um, and and with two objectives, we have to provide all the players with uh, sufficiently early um, with our uh, supervisory expectation because if we don't provide them or supervisory expectation um, innovators with uh, won't have the necessary feeling of the constraints and may uh, develop in I would say in, may have difficulties to develop uh, their innovation and of course, we have, as I said, to develop our future supervisors' uh, toolbox. I would just give an example because we started this with artificial intelligence, where um, we developed workshops uh, with voluntary actors to really understand. And I would say it's exactly the, the same approach described by Dirk when he said, uh, learning by doing. That's what we want to do also at the supervisory level. We, we want to learn by doing, so we want to test, to experiment, um, to experiment with workshops with the uh, voluntary bankers or insurance. We want to test technologies. We, we are thinking of organizing uh, tech sprints. And we also, an important point, um, we want to do, develop partnerships with, uh, with academics, with research, because some of these technologies need still to to be fueled by 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 the work of uh, of academics so i would stop here because i'm conscious of conscious of Thank time um, i would just add a, a simple sentences uh, we had to to be a contributor to to the innovation of the ecosystem because the if the ecosystem is able to innovate with um a good risk con with, with good risk control condition then it will be more resilient and that's our ultimate goal thank you very much uh, olivier uh, we are very short now in time but uh, the final words are for you marianne so uh, what you can see as uh, opportunities uh, emerging uh, from the from the innovative ecosystem in europe uh, what is uh, important to come I'll be very quick because uh, I think uh, everything has been covered already. Um, well, Olivier, you're perfectly right. Uh, the, uh, the, the opportunity is between the hands of pretty much everyone in the financial sector. And uh, the, the, the main uh, issue is whether we all work together. And you mentioned academics, but it's huge. Of course, uh, there are... Uh, uh, innovation is also between in their hands and uh, um, it's important to work with academ uh, academics with schools business schools uh, engineering schools to 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 train people to to, to work and understand all sectors um, and uh, and yes uh, I think uh, the opportunities is between our hands and let's see all technologies you mentioned the uh, AI blockchain I will also quote uh, quantum computing because uh, with regards to uh, cyber security it can be a uh, part of the solution so um, let's work on that in the next few months okay thank you thank you very much um, uh, I think that we are uh, quite short in time uh, uh, to, to, to take questions from, uh, from the audience. I see that there are some, some questions. Uh, uh, and uh, is, I think that there is also uh, the, the, the poll, uh, the poll, uh, a poll side, a slide for, to, to present the results. Uh, uh, I just want maybe to, 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 to conclude to say that uh, thank you very much for all your, your answers. Uh, of course, uh, uh, I think that uh, we have seen that uh, the, the COVID crisis is, uh, has been a, is a real accelerator for the digital transformation. And we have seen uh, how the financial sector has been able to adapt to. Uh, so a uh, very interesting uh, discussion. 
uh, innovation is uh, surely something that is really important for the, all the economy. And uh, what is also important, of course, is uh, that uh, this innovation uh, protects uh, the, the, the consumer, but we had also the discussion uh, re regarding all these topics. So thank you, thank you very much to, to all of you. Uh, and I give the, the, the floor, I think, to Philippe. Thierry, uh, thank you very much indeed. Thank you to the panel. A broad-ranging discussion. I think we covered an awful lot of stuff there. Uh, particularly interested that uh, we, uh, we picked up, both Marianne and others picked up on, on, on the governor's uh, observations about uh, complementarity between the various financial systems and structures and payment mechanisms and also the various participants. Uh, in the in the new digital economy uh, and I think there's a an interesting theme that you, you you mind which was about the getting the balance between innovation and experimentation on the one hand and stability and reliability uh, uh, on the other um, and towards the end I think Marianne introduced the fascinating uh, thought about quantum computing uh, of course, uh, quantum computing can be used by the, uh, the chaps with the black hats as well as the chaps with the white hats. So uh, it adds uh, some further complexity and, and so forth. But as we say in English, it was a wonderful tour d'horizon. Okay. Thank you to, to, to all the panelists and thank you, Philippe, uh, uh, for your work and words. Uh, so it now falls to me to move to the, the next stage of our seminar, which is to uh, introduce uh, Senor Pablo Hernandez de Cos, who is the uh, governor of the uh, Central Bank of Spain, uh, also clearly sits on the uh, ECB Governing Council, uh, was formerly the Bank of Spain's Director of Economics, uh, very well placed clearly to uh, understand uh, and comment on what is going on in the digital arena um, and is uh, very kindly agreed to speak to us uh, on the question of uh, CBDC and cross-border payments uh, and has also kindly agreed to take questions afterwards which you can submit via the uh, chat functions on the uh, at the foot of the screen, which I will place to him. So, uh, Governor Buenos Dias, lovely to see you. Thank you so much for taking the time to to come and speak to us. You have an audience of about 300 people from around the world, uh, all uh, eager to hear what you have to say. So, uh, I shall hand the, uh, the floor to you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Philip. Um, of course, uh, as usual, let me. Uh, start uh, by thanking UNFIF, uh, thanking uh, the Banque de France, uh, my, my good friend and colleague uh, Francois. The, unfortunately, uh, I couldn't uh, uh, see him this morning and I couldn't uh, listen to him this morning. I think he was uh, uh, talking about um, the, the, the review of our strategy uh, of monetary policy. Much easier uh, theme, I would say, than the one I will be trying to, to tackle uh, today. Um, as, uh, as you were saying, um, Philip, uh, um, well, um, I've been very vocal uh, in, in the last uh, two years, uh, I would say, about uh, emphasizing the growing relevance of uh, emerging uh, technologies for the financial system. And, uh, and I would say that in all my capacities, you know, as uh, chairman of the Basel Committee, as uh, chairman of the ABC of the ESRB, as uh, member of the Governing Council, and of course here domestically as governor of the, of the Bank of Spain, in all uh, in this fora, we are uh, clearly closely monitoring uh, trends uh, in order to, to fully understand uh, all these uh, uh, all these uh, technological uh, developments, uh, their uh, potential implications, uh, and of course, we uh, we want also to be uh, ready to, to act if uh, if if necessary. Um, I think I was not able to, to listen to the to the panel just uh, the, the last uh, panel uh, only to some of the remarks that uh, were made at the at the, at the very last uh, minute and, and and I fully agree with uh, the summary that was provided by by Thier, no, in the in the sense that it, it, it's interesting to to see that um, well uh, even if we've been emphasizing how important digitalization uh, has been. Um, it is now, uh, in the light of, uh, of the pandemic, that digitalization has become uh, even more critical no? and possibly 
uh, also uh, a catalyst for a tectonic uh, shift across uh, multiple dimensions products uh, services business model uh, distribution channels touch points uh, all over the industry um, i think we uh, might be closer today uh, than we were just a few months uh, ago uh, to uh, an, uh, an accelerated reshaping um, I think it's, uh, it's also important to emphasize what uh, Thierry was uh, also emphasizing, that um, uh, if anything, these uh, difficult times uh, have, uh, uh, in my view, proven that uh, a valuable uh, ally digitalization can be, uh, how this, uh, this uh, digitalization can be uh, to strengthen banks' uh, resilience and, and secure the necessary flow of funds uh, to society at, at large. Um, in my view, this has been absolutely uh, instrumental um, to mitigate uh, some of the damage uh, caused by the outbreak uh, uh, and the, the virtualization uh, of our economy uh, during the pandemic has uh, provided a necessary backstop uh, for many businesses uh, that used uh, to rely solely on their physical uh, presence. Uh, and as such, uh, um, I think it's important to emphasize that digitalization uh, has uh, proved to be uh, not again, as, as, as we've been emphasizing during the last years, not uh, not be a goal in itself, but rather a means to serve a, a much broader purpose, uh, as it offers um, a novel toolkit to push out the boundaries of what has been uh, possible in the past, allowing us to to address well-known and often challenging problems in a convenient and, and more uh, effective manner. And again, I think this crisis is probably the best uh, example that uh, that uh, we can have uh, in order to make uh, this uh, this point. Well, uh, the previous panels uh, has, uh, have already covered uh, this, let's say, COVID-related themes uh, in a quite extensive way, so I uh, would rather use my time to draw your attention to something uh, a bit different, and, but still uh, hopefully equally important and also interesting uh, for you, um, and related, of course, to the impact of digitalization. So um, I will comment uh, on the uh, way in which uh, this transformational process echoes in a specific context, uh, namely that of, uh, of a central bank, uh, uh, and in particular uh, in the role of a central bank as a service provider and, and the cross-cutting impact this may have on the broader uh, ecosystem. Uh, as in many other realms, the, the large uh, adoption of new technologies is also uh, likely to, to disrupt both the environment in which uh, we central banks uh, carry out our tax uh, and the choices uh, we need to, 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 to make on the best uh, possible approach uh, to, to those tax. Uh, and indeed, uh, this is uh, true for all central bank functions and responsibility, but um, maybe uh, I would uh, try to focus on, on, on one of them, uh, which uh, serves to illustrate the point uh, at this point, and also because I think it's particularly relevant. So I will focus primarily on one that is attracting also much interest uh, lately, which is our role as the sole issue uh, of, uh, legal, uh, of legal tender. So uh, ensuring adequate provision of a means of payment uh, that uh, is credit risk free uh, and fully and efficiently available and accessible to any uh, potential user group is uh, absolutely crucial, is uh, extremely important. I think we can uh, only agree on, on, on that. To date, uh, it's obvious that cash has been the, the only asset that enjoys uh, legal tender status and has played uh, this, this role. Yet, uh, the way cash uh, is, is embraced uh, nowadays uh, is heavily uh, influenced by uh, the increasing digitalization of society and, uh, of course, by technological uh, change in, in a more uh, general uh, way. Uh, for example, uh, the behavior uh, preferences, uh, even expectations of, of users are, are changing very rapidly as their experience with digital uh, technology uh, grows. Uh, novel uh, payment alternatives uh, provided either by uh, the private players, both traditional and non-traditional ones, or by public authorities. Again, uh, and I think you are fully uh, right, Philip, that uh, in this ecosystem uh, there, is, uh, there is room for, for public and, and private uh, players. Uh, this is uh, very important to, 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 be, to be said. Um, well, um, this uh, coexistence of private and players, uh, players in various uh, jurisdictions, uh, I think, may, it might also surface and or even expand uh, uh, um, the appeal uh, that uh, uh, the new instruments might have uh, as compared to, to banknotes and, and coins. Um, new features of existing payment instruments or services such as, for example, programmability, uh, I think uh, are now becoming possible thanks to emerging technologies. And um, therefore, besides uh, ensuring the ability, the availability of cash, uh, I think we all need to consider new ways of improving the efficiency of retail payments by leveraging 
uh, digital technology more uh, more extensively. Um, and all uh, this uh, could signal the need uh, probably to broaden the approach and explore uh, new opportunities uh, aiming to better address modern uh, society uh, and met uh, demands. In this uh, process, it is clear that the notion of a universally accessible uh, um, CBDC, um, so central bank uh, digital uh, currency, uh, stands out. Uh, uh, and that is a new type of central bank digital liability that could be made widely uh, available. A key aspect uh, uh, to underline is uh, that uh, a potential CBDC uh, could coexist perfectly well with physical cash, which serves uh, an important role and for which, uh, at least in the euro area, there is a still a strong demand. Um, so, uh, in other words, uh, um, I think we have to see traditional cash and uh, CBDC as uh, natural partners uh, rather than uh, potential substitutes uh, for, for each other, as they are often uh, presented by, by many people. Um, however, I think it's also important to emphasize that before taking any major decision on the issue of CBDC, uh, several important questions uh, need to be uh, addressed, need to be answered. Um, what precise complementary role uh, would cash uh, bank accounts and digital accounts uh, play? I think this is a crucial uh, question to, to be answered. Should uh, central banks focus on securing a sound regulation that offers appropriate safeguards and leave the private sector to come up with viable alternatives? Or uh, uh, on the contrary, should uh, we ensure the provision of a safe asset by issue, a CBDC? No? By, by ourselves. So these are, I would say, the critical, the critical questions that need to be, uh, to be addressed. As, uh, as you know, when faced uh, with a case of practical use, even one as apparently simple as this, embracing uh, the opportunities that new technologies offer is not always uh, crystal clear. Uh, what's more, uh, when approaching this topic in more detail, many questions and far-reaching implications arise, thus suggesting the need to treat uh, cautiously uh, uh, in an unknown uh, uh, territory. Um, I refer, uh, of course, to the myriads of design and operational design aspects, uh, such as uh, whether these, for example, this uh, new digital cash should preserve all the features of traditional bank uh, notes and coins. For example, the, the important issue of uh, anonymity comes to, to my mind. Or, or whether some of the key processes, such as uh, know your customer or compliance with uh, AML, so at one laundering uh, requirements, should remain in the hands of the private sector for, for efficiency uh, reasons or not. Um, it, in any event, uncertainties uh, arise both about the degree of maturity of the different IT uh, choices uh, and the greater security risks they may uh, entail. Uh, on top of, it, uh, of this, and I want to emphasize this uh, point uh, in a particular way, we must uh, also be aware that the CBDC may possibly uh, bring uh, uh, with it some unwanted uh, side effects. Uh, and I'm referring, of course, to a potential increase uh, of this intermediation of the financial uh, sector uh, uh, eroding bank's deposit uh, base or uh, it's even the, its lending capacity uh, and well, the potential of uh, even having a greater risk, risk of, of, of bank runs, in particular in, in the middle of, uh, of a crisis. Uh, um, with, all, with all this, what I want to, 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 to emphasize is that it's our responsibility uh, first to apprehend what is uh, at stake with our decisions and then to determine the conditions and, and, and the scenarios in which a public digital currency offers the most benefits while minimizing the, the drawbacks. Um, this certainly requires a strong commitment from us, placing a, a special emphasis on drawing conclusions based on, on sound research and analysis. I think this is very important because, I mean, if anything, central banks have always based their decisions on, on rigorous analysis previous to the decisions that uh, fundamentally uh, base uh, those uh, those decisions, and this is uh, also critical that uh, we keep this rigorous analysis also in this in this in this domain. Uh, and in addition, and also importantly, it calls uh, for uh, our proactive engagement in a practical experimentation uh, phase. That this was also mentioned in the previous uh, panel. Um, of course, the, the the objective is that this experiment uh, experimentation phase shed light on the nature. And the, and the scale uh, as well of the pain points. There are pain points. We know that there, there, there will be pain points. There will be problems. There will be underlying threats. Uh, and, 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 and of course, we, know, we have to know them well and also uh, to, to, to discover what the potential uh, solutions uh, might, uh, might be. Um, this is why, um, while the issuance of a digital euro is not foreseen in the immediate future, the, the ecosystem. Um, has uh, a keen interest uh, to tackle the challenges arising from possible future scenarios. And as uh, you may know, many other central banks uh, are already analyzing this possibility. Uh, uh, along these lines, 
you may have already uh, heard about the test uh, that the People's Bank of China is currently carrying out in a number of provinces. You may also know the extensive work that preceded the, the well-publicized uh, e-corona pilot uh, in Sweden. Uh, you may also uh, be aware of the Fed's uh, recent annou announcement of its intention uh, to remain on the frontier of uh, research and policy development regarding CBDCs. Uh, and uh, in our case, uh, uh, ECB uh, President uh, Lagarde mentioned uh, just a few uh, weeks uh, ago uh, that earlier this year the Euro system decided uh, to set up a, a task force to explore the benefits, uh, also the risks, and uh, uh, for sure the personal challenges of introducing a, a, digital, a digital euro. The results of the work will uh, soon be uh, shared publicly. Uh, however, uh, what I uh, can uh, say today uh, this will be only the first step in a more uh, profound reflection that still has uh, to take uh, place. And in this sense, uh, I'm convinced that uh, in order to deliver a successful roadmap for a potential, um, an underlying potential issuance of a digital euro, we must establish a certain set of uh, priorities at front. And um, I want uh, to be now a bit more precise about this. And there are three elements uh, of these uh, priorities that uh, for me deserve uh, 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 attention. Um, first, uh, uh, to start with, uh, I believe we should deepen the current standing uh, of our work. Uh, the, this means not just promoting a wide-ranging uh, exchange of views within the Euro system and with uh, other European authorities and institutions, but also engaging uh, other re relevant stakeholders in our discussions, including, of course, the private uh, sector uh, and, for sure, as well, uh, the academia, which is also playing uh, an increasing uh, uh, attention to this, uh, to this issue. In my view, it is uh, this active dialogue uh, that will help us understand the full range of implications of a CBDC and the minimum requirements that the euro uh, denominated CBDC uh, should. Uh, um. Second point, uh, uh, and as uh, mentioned uh, earlier, uh, I believe we need to place a strong emphasis on developing a rigorous experimentation agenda that will help us make uh, informed uh, policy decisions about the different uh, design uh, options. Um, this entails um, identifying the key questions that remain open and need to be uh, further analyzed by means of hands-on experience. I think this is absolutely crucial. And formulating the corresponding concrete uh, testing uh, proposals. Um, and we must uh, bear in mind that private agents, and uh, again, uh, uh, could be instrumental for the ultimate success of this exercise, so it's important that uh, we make sure uh, to count them in, in uh, early on. Um, final point on, 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 this, um, on this issue, uh, international cooperation uh, with other central banks needs uh, to remain high on the agenda to identify best practices, avoid unnecessary fragmentation and help achieve interoperability across borders. Uh, and in this sense, um, I believe that the role uh, of international organizations uh, and standard setters uh, for sure, the Basel uh, Committee as well, but in particular the, 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 the BIS, uh, should play a role uh, as a hub of, uh, for central banks in the following years. So, regardless of, uh, of its importance, uh, expanding access uh, to a central bank's uh, balance sheet uh, by making a CBDC available to households and non-financial corporations is only one of uh, many ways in which technological innovation may help enhance the monetary and payment uh, systems. Uh, and indeed, uh, given how dynamic uh, the payment market is uh, nowadays, we need to keep abreast of uh, and closely uh, monitor any private initiatives that may overlap in the field of action of uh, CBDC. Um, uh, and this is uh, because they may ultimately uh, prove uh, to be equally uh, viable options for achieving the, the same goals or remedy some of the uh, common and long-standing uh, shortcomings that traditional uh, channels uh, have uh, faced. In that uh, respect, I think, uh, I think it's important that we uh, recognize uh, that uh, the current landscape of evolving market infrastructures poses several telling examples, uh, um, but, uh, and I will concentrate on, on some of them, and in particular on one particular area, which is uh, the, uh, those of payments that have a multi-country uh, dimension. Um, Cross-jurisdictional uh, payments enjoy a growing interest uh, all over the world, uh, you know that, uh, and not only because of uh, their potential um, as a test bed uh, for new technologies, but also due uh, to the uh, growing relevance of e-commerce, international trade and, and migration, for sure. Um, let's uh, take uh, the words of uh, John Cunliffe, the, the CPMI uh, chair. Uh, when, when saying that the global financial transfers uh, uh, amounted to well over 20 trillion 
dollars in 2019 and are expected to hit uh, 30 trillion dollars uh, by 2022 with the current uh, forecast available. Other aspects such as addressing front-end uh, fragmentation in the common market, swiftly achieving uh, greater scale and uh, securing a stronger uh, European governance also explain why this uh, topic uh, is uh, becoming an increasing uh, concern for the, for the EU area. Uh, given the differences uh, both in scope and goals, I think it is best uh, for the sake of clarity if I walk uh, uh, you through these various projects one by one. So um, let's start with the later case. Uh, I would like to mention the recent decision by 16 uh, major European banks in various uh, member states to launch the European Payment Initiative, the so-called EPI. This project uh, builds on the success of the uh, single payment, uh, single euro payment area, uh, SEPA, which uh, led the foundations for a truly co cohesive cashless euro payment space and has made an uh, essential contribution to the efficiency and competitiveness of uh, the European economy. However, despite um, and all the efforts, uh, SEPA fell short in delivering full integration at the point of sale, thus uh, leaving the door open for alternative proposals uh, such uh, as the, the API. Uh, and by leveraging uh, their large uh, market sales, uh, the API promoters aim to deploy a unified payment solution for consumers and merchants across Europe encompassing a payment card and a digital wallet to cover all potential uses uh, at, the poten at the point of, of interaction, uh, in a store, online, person-to-person, -person, and cash uh, withdrawals. To further uh, increase its appeal, uh, settlement uh, will be instant uh, via uh, SEPA instant credit transfers, which, of course, uh, is also uh, a, crucial, a crucial issue. From a Eurosystem perspective, the EPI highlights how uh, market players can work together efficiently in the pursuit of the common objective and harness technology to transform the payment landscape in line uh, with the private interest, but also being compatible with our uh, public uh, strategy. Again, this combination of public and, and, and private data and being emphasized from the beginning of this uh, intervention. Uh, central banks, uh, we need to closely uh, follow the process uh, of any such initiatives and, where necessary, consider the need to take action should uh, such market failures uh, persist. Um, on a different uh, yet uh, related note, uh, international cross-border payment arrangements are another uh, compelling case study on how to bring this specific domain into uh, the 21st century. Despite not yet being overwhelmingly disrupted by digital innovations, their flows have recently come under the spotlight thanks to initiatives such as Libra, which have clearly targeted this market segment uh, with the promise to overcome its present uh, weaknesses. And I think we cannot forget this, not that the, the, the origin of Libra's these weaknesses in the, in the international uh, landscape. Uh, indeed, uh, as attested by the recent uh, Financial Stability Board and the Committee on Payments and Market uh, Infrastructure, the CPMI, um, the report that were produced uh, to the G20 uh, of these uh, institutions, cross-border payments still suffer a number of long-standing uh, frictions which uh, hamper uh, global trade, hamper uh, development, uh, economic development, and also economic growth. Uh, this include, uh, in particular, legacy te technology uh, platforms, limited uh, operating hours, onerous compliance, compliance checks, um, alongside other relevant uh, aspects such as high funding costs, weak competition, or an insufficient uh, degree of uh, standardization. Uh, in this light, it comes as no surprise that this issue is one of the top priorities on the G20 strategic agenda for 2020, as you perfectly uh, know. Um, accordingly, uh, since uh, last December, the, the FSB and the, the CPMI, with the support of uh, other international uh, organizations, have been working together on defining the necessary building blocks to deliver a global uh, roadmap uh, that can help achieve uh, the required uh, structural uh, improvements. Interestingly, this reform program uh, is a combination of practical steps and indicative time frames, uh, but, and it does not uh, uh, hinge only on technological developments, rather uh, it uh, encourages combining these new technologies with more traditional measures and advocates establishing a sound shared vision as a first step in the lane of the necessary uh, foundations. This implies that to really uh, achieve a profound transformation, an ambitious uh, range of actions is required beyond the mere operational uh, or technical aspects, like the development of international guidelines, the uh, improvement of surveillance practices, uh, or the removal of obstacles to the exchange of data, just uh, to name uh, a few of those that are incorporated into uh, this uh, agenda. Um, nevertheless, the importance of digital technology in this context should uh, not be underplayed. 
even though uh, its potential uh, may only be realized in the long uh, run. Indeed, it is worth mentioning that the number of the enhancements foreseen as part of this action plan are ultimately designed to help knock down some of the existing uh, barriers to the emergence of new cross border payment infrastructures and uh, arrangements. So, um, let me uh, now conclude by sharing with you some final uh, thoughts. Um, after all uh, we've uh, heard today, I think it is safe to say that none of us disputes uh, the idea that digital technologies uh, are at the very heart of all serious present day attempts to achieve any kind of sustainable cutting edge innovation. Moreover, in the aftermath of, the, of this crisis, it is fair to expect that the financial services um, will have no choice but to continue to navigate the uncharted waters of digital transformation uh, on the lookout for a safe harbor that will provide shelter and hopefully a gateway to a booming uh, marketplace. As central bankers uh, with a clear uh, public policy agenda mandate, we cannot refrain from meeting our obligations in this context. This is uh, absolutely uh, obvious. And consequently, as the need for a major uh, uh, makeover becomes more pressing, I believe that financial authorities should take a, a very proactive stance towards uh, digital innovation. We should do so uh, by striking the right balance between responsible parties, assignments, and the necessary guardrails, whilst ensuring uh, optimal provision of what the BIS uh, General Manager, uh, Agustin Karsten, uh, likes uh, to call uh, central bank uh, public uh, goods. For this reason, uh, central banks must try to stay ahead of the curve and be ready to embrace experimentation and research on these topics as soon as possible, while uh, building bridges uh, with all the relevant stakeholders and closely scrutinizing the progress that their uh, initiatives achieve in related uh, fields. Only this strategy will pay dividends in the long run and pave uh, the way for a future that best serves the needs and maximizes the welfare of uh, our uh, society. So many thanks for your attention. Uh, I, with this, I, I will end and I'm happy, as uh, you feel, uh, made clear at the, at the introduction to take some, floor, some, some questions from, from the floor. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Governor. That's a, a great uh, addition to the debates that we've had today and has moved the, ar the, the arguments and the discussion along. I, I have to say, I am, along with I think many of our audience, um, uh, eager uh, for the uh, publication of both the BIS uh, and the uh, ECB uh, studies uh, uh, into this subject, which uh, both you and uh, uh, indeed Francois have uh, given us intriguing little hints and, 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 and insights into uh, today. Uh, so keen to see what the full thing says. One thing both Many governors, yourself, Francois, and indeed your your peer Andrew Bailey of the Bank of England, have in recent weeks in major speeches stressed that the public sector must not lag behind the private sector in terms of uh, payment technology, in terms of introduction of currencies, and that therefore um, it is incumbent upon the authorities to move quickly to establish a regulatory framework uh, against which the private sector will be judged. Um, we're struggling to see this on a domestic basis and still less on a, uh, a cross-border basis. I just wondered, what are your views on the emerging development of, of, of regulation and will it be able both to keep pace with and indeed to permit the kind of innovation that everybody uh, everybody would like to see. Hmm. Well, of course, um, Philip, I cannot more than agree that um, this is a crucial issue. By the way, not a new one. No? So, in terms of uh, the, the, the trade the trade offs between uh, promoting uh, innovation on the one hand and at the same time um, to have a um, a, 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 an environment that is safe enough uh, is the typical trade-off uh, that uh, regulators, not only financial regulators, but in general uh, economic regulators, uh, have uh, always been uh, facing. Um, and uh, here, uh, perhaps, uh, um, I should stress uh, maybe two points. No? The first one is um, the current environment is clear and that is allowing for this innovation to happen. Uh, and what perhaps is not so obvious 
is that all market players are in the same position, okay? Precisely because um, the regulation in the financial sector is normally more stringent than in other domains. And probably this is allowed, surely, this is allowed those, uh, those market players that are not financial institutions to come into, uh, 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 into the markets that were traditionally uh, in the hands of the, of the financial sector. So here, I think the typical mantra that we always say uh, of uh, well, same activities, same regulations uh, is very important uh, to, uh, to be in order to keep a level playing field, I think is absolutely uh, crucial. Um, but at, at the same time, we all know, Philip, that it's, it's not easy to, to, to achieve. Uh, and, and here, what uh, for me is, uh, is important is, uh, 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 is that um, financial regulators should uh, talk uh, and even agree with other regulators um, judicial system on the on the on the one hand, competition authorities uh, on the on the on the on the other, data uh, protection uh, uh, regulators uh, uh, as well, uh, in order precisely to create an environment that uh, uh, guarantees this level playing field. This is a, a, an important uh, point uh, for me. And the second, of course, is uh, international coordination. Of course, you were mentioning the, uh, the you were putting the emphasis on the domestic uh, domain. Uh, but of course, we know that uh, many of these markets are, are not domestic uh, and will not be uh, domestic uh, in the future, will become even more uh, global. Um, and uh, well, of course, here the role uh, played by, by international uh, setters uh, like the Basel Committee, CPMI, etc., BIS in general, uh, I think is absolutely uh, crucial uh, as well. And, and, and in, moving to that, uh, the, Clearly, some new partnerships between public and private sectors are going to be developed. And I, I hear two broad lines of thought here. One says uh, the authorities should set out some core rules of the game uh, and then step aside and let the private sector get on with it. Um, so there will be a whole brain draft perhaps of privately issued currencies operating to some common technical and uh, regulatory standards and there's another view that says no actually uh, this has to be driven by the public sector because issuing uh, a trusted means of payment is a primary sovereign function that must be handled by by the state uh, uh, however, the private sector can play a role, uh, maybe in the distribution, maybe in the processing, but under the supervision of the state. But w w which way do you do you tend on on, on that? Yeah, no, I'm, I'm, I'm clearly in the second <laughs> in, in the second uh, uh, of the um, uh, environments that you were mentioning. No? I mean, if, if we talk about currencies, okay. Um, it is clear that the role uh, should uh, be exclusively uh, of the public uh, of the public sector, as the traditional de definition of currency, uh, of course. Um, and this is why we've uh, never liked um, the, 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 the terminology of stable coins, for example. Well, because they are not coins. Well, they are not even stable. But uh, uh, first, they are they are not uh, they are not coins. No, they are assets. And they should be considered as, as that because uh, coins uh, and, and currencies uh, are uh, or should be uh, for sure only uh, issued by uh, by the public sector. But which, of course, as you were uh, clearly and, and uh, emphasizing, Philip, doesn't mean that there is not a role for the private sector. But the, the role for the private sector is, uh, I mean, in the in the way this uh, this currency is distributed, let's say, and put in the hands of the of the public. Um, and, uh, which is, by the way, an important role, no? because uh, uh, clearly there, uh, and technological de developments uh, might uh, help, uh, crucially here, uh, might help to, 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 to make uh, this, uh, as a means of payments, much more uh, efficient for, for, for of us as, as, as citizens. Um, I have a question from uh, a gentleman, uh, Senor Enrique Titos, who sounds like a, a compatriot of yours, who, who <laughs> wishes to hear, in your view, is there any catalyst, any further catalyst that would accelerate uh, the deployment of a retail CBDC 
from the ECB, i.e. within the Eurozone? Or, or, or do you think you have all the, with COVID and technology and so forth, you have all the momentum you need? Hmm. No, I think the, the catalyst, um, there are several catalysts. There were, uh, some of them were already here no, with us uh, before, uh, before the pandemic. Uh, I, mean, the, 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 I was uh, mentioning this at the beginning of my intervention. Um, what COVID uh, has done uh, in this domain uh, is, um, let's say, only emphasizing you know, let's, uh, some, of the, some of the trends that we were already facing. Um, and well, the, the, the emergence of the, of the Libra project was uh, a very good uh, mm. example. So, and this is why the, the, the ECB, the EU system, has reacted uh, very, very quickly. But it has reacted not, I mean, it was at the, at the, at the beginning of the year we were discussing these issues um, uh, for, for, for long. Um, but uh, uh, it was just before you know, the, the pandemic was hitting us uh, that, um, that we were thinking about this and, and this is why we have entered. And I think this is why we should enter and we should, uh, uh, this report that will be published soon, as you said, uh, Philippe, is, uh, will be only a first, uh, first step. So the catalysts are already here. So we don't need more catalysts. Of course, um, we have to, we, we have to, we have to con, uh, consider different scenarios no? because, of course, we don't know the speed of this, uh, of all this technological uh, process, uh, how this will uh, evolve. But we have to be prepared even for those scenarios on which the technological uh, pro uh, uh, progress is, 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 uh, is very, very rapid, which seems to be the case, by the way. It seems to be even the, 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 base, the baseline scenario. Mm. One final question, Governor, because I know you have to leave at, ha at half past yes. on the yes. yes. A number of speakers, uh, governors and so forth have expressed a desire that cash and uh, CBDC can coexist in the same space. Um, and my question really is, given that one of the great attractions of CBDC is that it improves the, allegedly improves the efficiency and reduces the cost of the existing payment system and permits uh, monetary authorities to do lots of other smart things via programmable money. Um, would it not be counterintuitive to have the old physical cash and the new CBDC running side by side? Mm. No, no, I don't think so. I think it's, a, it's absolutely crucial. And here, Philip, let me, I was using um, this, um, this example of a trade-off you know, between innovation and revolution at the, at the very beginning with your first question. Here, there is a also a traditional trade-off um, in the public sector domain, which is um, between efficiency and social uh, objectives. And, and here is a very good uh, example. No? Of course, maybe for efficiency reasons, um, you might uh, like uh, to, defi to, to define a CBDC that is the, the, the exclusive no? uh, means of, of payment, uh, and you eliminate completely banknotes and, and coins. But it is clear that for social purposes, purposes and in particular for social inclusion, you need to keep uh, banknotes and, and coins. Uh, otherwise, many people, uh, and in particular uh, old people, for example, would be absolutely uh, uh, excluded from, 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 from this. It will have a cost, of course, keeping both, probably, mm -hmm. uh, but we have to accept that this is, uh, again, uh, is, is justified by uh, social inclusion uh, objectives, which are the legitimate, by the way. It's not uh, it, it, only efficiency, the only goal that uh, at least the public sector should, uh, should uh, pursue. So it, the, the, uh, the, those costs should be borne on the public purse then? Absolutely. Yes. Well, that's, that's clear and um, uh, very interesting, if I may say so, because uh, that, that presents a, a very strong line in the sand that says uh, that there are public duties that are incumbent around the issue of, of, of fiat currency uh, that can't simply be, be abandoned in order to, uh, to, to profit from technological convenience and innovation. So uh, and that, I think, presents some very important dimensions to the debate. Um, as I said, I know you have to go, so I'd like to thank you on behalf of the audience, uh, on behalf of uh, Bon de France and OMFIF uh, for a, a fascinating address. We hope we can hear more of you. Uh, w w when the veil, when the mantilla is lifted, uh, from from the ECB, uh, but thank you very much indeed, and look forward to seeing you again. Um, 
and I will pass back to my colleague uh, Thierry at the, the Banque de France. Thierry. Who is having enormous problems. Uh, uh, La France écoute, mais elle ne parle pas en ce moment. Um, <laughs> Thierry, we, we can't hear you at all. Um, so before we do hear Thierry, may I uh, uh, end my participation by saying on behalf of OMFIF, thank you very much indeed to uh, the governors of the Banque de France, the Banque d'Espagne, uh, to the Banque de France for uh, hosting this, uh, to our panelists, to our audience uh, from across the world, um, uh, if you enjoyed it, um, please let me know. If you didn't, please uh, write to Thierry. Um, I'm hoping <laughs> he's now uh, with us in sound, as in... Hello? Uh, as in... Yes, Hello? so over Sorry. to you, Thierry. Yes, <laughs> okay, thank you. Difficult to switch uh, for the microphone. Thank you very much. Uh, so thank you, uh, uh, everybody. I would like to, to, to warmly thank all the speakers and, uh, of course, uh, Mr. Pablo Hernandez de Cos and uh, Francois Pindroit de Gallo, uh, and also all the, the, the panelists that we had uh, uh, Marianne, of course, Olivier, Dirk, and, uh, and Pietro. Uh, I would like also to thank all the people who followed all the, the, the interventions and, uh, of course, uh, also the panel. Um, as uh, Mr. François Villeroy de Gallo said, we, we planned initially to receive you in Paris, to welcome you in Paris, uh, here at the Banque de France, unfortunately, so it was not uh, possible this year, uh, but we hope that uh, it can be possible in the future, and we will be uh, very happy to, to, to welcome a, a conference again. So thank you, thank you very much, and thank you uh, uh, to you, Philippe, and your team for uh, uh, organizing with me all this uh, this conference.